Hello, everybody. It is Professor Parrish. It is week six. It is time, boy, to talk about poetry. <laughs> um, before I do, though, because I'm going to launch into chapter 12 of our textbook here very soon, I do want to do a couple of housekeeping things and give you guys an idea of what we're going to talk about in this video. So I am on our site. I am switching over to student view. Uh, I've got all of your papers. <laughs> I've only graded one so far. <laughs> I am. Um, I try to keep up. Your discussion forum is graded. The first exam is graded. All of that, except for your paper number one, is graded. So your grade is updated except for paper number one, which will have a big impact on your grade. So um, I take my time grading papers because I want to give, you know, you put a lot of work into this paper, so I want to take my time in grading them. So please bear with me. I know I've had students in the past that have emailed and asked, you know, when's my paper going to be graded? It will be this week. <laughs> Just give me, uh, be patient with me, and you should get an email with my feedback, as well as you should get your paper draft back with all of my edits. Now, next week, for week seven, I'm going to go over how to revise paper number one, because you do get an opportunity, if you turned in your paper, you get a chance to revise it. So I'm going to go over that next week in week seven. So just be on the lookout this week. You should get paper number one back from me at some point this week with a grade attached to it, and you will get a chance to revise that paper for a higher grade, which we'll talk about next week. Um, for this week, in terms of what is due, you have, uh, we're going to talk about paper number two. <laughs> I know you guys just finished paper one. You're like, give me a break. But um, paper number two is our second paper we're going to do before spring break. So crazy to think about spring break, right? So we're going to talk about that at the end of this video. And your discussion forum for week six is due this week. Posts are due Friday. Responses are due Sunday. So this is a pretty low-key week. I know we had a lot going on last week. This week, we're just going to focus on the thesis for paper two. We're going to talk about it. And we're just going to focus on a discussion forum this week. So nothing crazy, all right? Just going to lay back, relax, and just kind of breathe in now that fiction is over, right? And as you can see on here, this presentation that I'm going to go over today is going to talk about uh, chapter 12, which is the poetry preview chapter in our Discovering Literature textbook. Now, in the Concise Engage Handbook, we are still going through uh, reviewing basics. Uh, thinking critically is the theme this week. And so as you can see, there's 10 pages there in that book. Uh, I think thinking critically is a good thing to talk about this week because we're starting poetry, which will require some critical thinking. And we're going to talk about that as well. But <laughs> uh, in the meantime, we are going to talk about chapter 12 and you can always, uh, and as well as your paper number two guidelines for that. So uh, with that being said, <laughs> it is time to dive in to poetry. <laughs> I absolutely love fiction. I would say of all the genres, fiction is what I interact most with. Um, it's what I'm most attracted to as a reader. And I think of all the genres, fiction and prose is what I, I lean to most. However, when it comes to teaching, I kind of have developed a love for teaching poetry. <laughs> and I honestly think that's because most students coming into poetry have two views. They are either in love with poetry, they have written many a poem in their high school journals, <laughs> and will have you know, um, or they absolutely don't understand poetry and hate it and are terrified of it and think that it is the end-all be-all. Poetry is not for everybody. It is not everybody's cup of tea. However, I do think that poetry is fun to learn about. I appreciate poetry. I was one of them, <laughs> one of those journalistic children back in high school that was writing down all my emotions in my emo journal and all my angsty poetry. I was that kid, um, even though I didn't really have a grasp for reading a lot of poetry. I sure like to write it, um, but I digress. I really like the terminology that we're going to talk about in this chapter, in this unit. I think that what we talk about in poetry is not only an extension of what we talked about in prose, but it will carry on 
to other genres. And you may find some of the terminology we talk about with poetry actually reflecting back onto prose, which is kind of interesting. You're like, we just finished with fiction, but some of these terms, they could apply to fiction too. And that's what's awesome about it. Poetry, it's very critical thinking oriented. It's It can be deep, it can be fun, but above all, and we're going to talk about this, poetry is language at its best. So this presentation on your resources page goes through chapters 12 through 15. We are only going to talk about chapter 12 today in this video for week six. Um, I will ask that we go, we'll, we'll be going back and forth to this uh, PowerPoint for the next couple of weeks, but for today, we're only doing slides one through seven. So uh, hunger in, <laughs> it won't be a long video, but I've got a lot to say, and I'm excited to get you all excited about poetry. I'm not going to make you all poetry fans by the end of this unit, but my goal is to at least give you an appreciation of poetry and what all it does for language and literature itself. So let us begin. In your textbook on page 611, where we start chapter 12, each of our chapters has a picture that prefaces what is to come when the chapter starts. And usually they're they're very subtle you can kind of see the connection like when we talked about symbolism there was that big tree with the roots coming down from it that kind of showed meaning beyond the surface and i really like that visual this though is probably my favorite picture in the whole book and um if you can see it, it is of michael jordan about to throw the basketball into the hoop and i will give you all a little bit of backstory um, I grew up in the 90s, and Michael Jordan was the man <laughs> at the time. When I was a kid, um, we all had our big puffer jackets with our favorite NBA teams on it, and I was a Chicago Bulls. I had my big puffer jacket, and Michael Jordan was like the most awesome thing ever. And I was at that age in grade school when Space Jam came out. I was at the perfect age for being a big fan of Michael Jordan. And so um, as soon as I saw this picture in this book, I was like, exactly this is perfect so my question to you all would be why in the world would michael jordan be the face quote unquote of poetry i mean he is the picture that starts us all off why i would point out that this textbook was originally published the first edition was published back in 2001 2002 um, that was coming off the heels of michael jordan and the chicago bulls having won so many back-to-back -back championships so I would give you a moment to pause and think, why Michael Jordan? Why is he the representation of poetry? Our textbook starts out with calling poetry language at its best. I absolutely love that because it is so true. You all have probably read good poetry. You've probably read bad poetry. If it's bad poetry, then this kind of doesn't apply, but good poetry is extremely specific. Every word is crafted for a specific emotion, a specific moment, a specific purpose. Fiction can have quote unquote fluff. And you all probably experienced that reading novels and books. There, there are chapters where you're like, ah, this is kind of just padding the story out, isn't it? I was one of those people that read Twilight when it first came out. Let me tell you, New Moon, Eclipse, ugh, Eclipse is nothing but fluff. <laughs> and <laughs> don't at me, <laughs> but novels and prose can have those moments where things are padded out, drawn out and expanded on. And they seem almost like filler or fluff because they're just kind of slowly leading us to the next point. Poetry is extremely concise. It's shorter. I mean, one poem could be four lines long. And in those four lines, that author has to craft an exact emotion, purpose and message, which is incredibly hard to do. So saying that poetry is language at its best is an understatement. A good poet has to spend so much time crafting and editing and reworking to get everything emotionally and exactly the way they want it. So when we go back to Michael Jordan, who in the late 1990s was considered one of the best NBA players of his generation, that's why he's used in this textbook to represent poetry. His work as a basketball player was at its best. I mean, his performance was probably at its best as it could be for an NBA player. So having him represent poetry, I think, is a very accurate um, 
you know, analogy and it's an accurate, accurate, um, summation and, uh, symbolism there. I think it's pretty, it's pretty cool that they did that because we don't usually see sports too tied with, uh, literature or writing and here it is. <laughs> so poetry is different than other genres of literature and our chapter 12 starts out by telling us that one, it comes from a confusing flow of experience. Um, Rachel McKibben, who, when I taught this class face to face, we would look specifically at her work. It's extremely dark. It's very disturbing, but it comes from, she's come from a very abusive, traumatizing childhood. And so her poetry is a means not only of therapy, but it's a means of expressing her story, telling her experience and trying to sort out for herself all of these confusing things that have happened and to kind of almost serve as a way of her trying to figure out through writing, what will this experience do to me and my family in the future? So poetry can be confusing. It's meant to be because it's, it's an author expressing emotions and feelings sometimes that they can't just get out through prose. It needs to be a little bit more intimate than that. It does not just give data or facts. Poetry, you could read a whole poem about a blade of grass. Does it have a meaning? Who knows? Um, the Jabberwocky and Alice in Wonderland. I'm sure Lewis Carroll was like, we're going to have some fun with language and that's what we're going to do. And that's what we're here for. But he didn't really have a specific agenda with the Jabberwocky with that poem or any fact he was trying to give out. He was just trying to write an entertaining piece of poetic literature. Um, and of course, Poetry is printed as lines of verse. They are not typically in paragraph form. There is one exception, which we'll talk about as the chapters roll on. But typically when you think of a poem, you see little short lines that are called verse and typically they rhyme. We'll talk about that. They don't always have to, but um, they have a pattern, a form, and they have a specific look to them. Usually again, we'll talk about that. Uh, poetry terminology, as we define it in chapter 12, we start out with an epic. An epic, which we've kind of coined that phrase in our culture and made it pretty mainstream, but epic started out being a poetic term that talked about a long poem with an elevated style. Um, probably the most common example I can think of is Beowulf. Now you may think Beowulf is prose because it doesn't seem like it rhymes, that is because we are reading the English translation and in the English translation or most English translations, the rhyming is completely lost because it wouldn't make sense. But in the original language that Beowulf was written in, it did have a rhyming rhythmic aspect to it. And it very much was a poem, a long poem, <laughs> a very long poem. And that is exactly what an epic is. It is a long poem with an elevated style, a rhythm, a beat, some kind of um, literary elegance to it that makes it more than just prose. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum are lyrics, which we hear lyrics every single day. If you listen to the radio at all, or Pandora or whatever, or YouTube, um, you are listening to lyrics all the time. They are just short poems. Um, they may rhyme, they may not. They may have a chorus, they may not. Um, they may just be instrumental but they are, you know, ly they're lyrical. Um, now if it was instrumental, it has to have words to be a lyric, but I get ahead of myself. But, um, yeah, if you hear a song on the radio and there are words to it, it's a lyric. Now we also have the term extended metaphor. We've talked about metaphor in prose, which is comparing two things without using like or as, and metaphors do happen a lot in poetry. We see metaphors occur quite often in poetry and when a metaphor sort of is expanded throughout the entire length of the poem, that is called an extended metaphor. So if the whole poem is about a specific symbol or comparison, then it's an extended metaphor. Rhyme is talked about on page 2624, and that is the echo effect produced when a poet repeats the same sound that is found at the end of final syllables. So rhyme is probably the term we most often associate with poetry because a lot of people think that all poems have to rhyme, which is not true. I personally am a fan of rhyming poetry. I think it's classic and traditional, but we will talk about the more avant-garde areas of poetry soon enough. But if it rhymes, so if you say like time, 
um, slime, lime, crime. Those all have a, that I'm, that last syllable is what rhymes. <laughs> and you could say rhyme too in that. Um, a stanza is a set of related lines in a poem. So on page two, 625, you can see at the very top of page 625 that there is a stanza there. It's a, a verse, a series of lines, and you'll notice there's little letters out to the side of it. Um, they say like A, B, and C. I can't really show that there. Yeah, they say A, B, and C. That is the pattern. So that's the rhyme scheme that they've put out to the side to help us. And you'll notice that when you read poetry, reading poetry to yourself versus reading at it out loud is a very different experience because when you read it out loud the words if it's good the words almost trick you into saying it a certain way it's kind of cool so if you look on uh, page 625 there we have um, and I'm not the author so I'm not exactly 100% sure how they intended this poem to be read but you could say fear no more the heat of the Sun nor the furious winters rages Thou thy worldly task hast done, home art gone and taken thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers, come to dust. Oh, kind of gruesome, a little bit morbid there at the end. But you can see out to the side we have our rhyme scheme. So sun is A. So when you ever start, whenever you try to figure out the pattern of a poem, the first uh, last word there is always lettered A. And then we have sun, but then the second line is rages. Well, sun and rages don't rhyme. So you have sun is A, rages is B. Then we have done. Now done and sun do rhyme. So we have A, B, A. Then we have wages. Rages and wages rhyme. So we have A, B, A, B. And then the last two lines, must and dust, they rhyme with each other, but nothing else. So our rhyme scheme for this stanza is A, B, A, B, C, C. And there may be coming, uh, there may come an assignment, uh, paper number two, where you need to identify um, the rhyme scheme of a poem. And so you'll need to say, you know, these sun and done rhyme, rages, wages, dust and must rhyme. You don't have to letter them necessarily, but you need to be able to point out the rhyme scheme present in the poem. Now, meter, foot, and iambic. Oh, iambic feet. Um, usually when people try to sound like they really know poetry, they'll be like, oh, it's iambic pentameter or something like that. But um, we'll talk about <laughs> iambic uh, feet, and I'm really excited about the uh, example I'm going to show you all. So meter is the regulated, free-flowing rhythm of ordinary speech. So if something has meter, that means it has a free-flowing rhythm. So you'll notice at the end of that last stanza, where I said, golden lads and girls all must as chimney sweepers come to dust. So you'll notice my voice wants to kind of create a rhythm with that. That's meter. So on page 626, I love that we're given Robert Frost's uh, walking through the woods on a snowy evening. We're given his a stanza, a verse of his poem there. And I'm going to read this, and I want you to try to catch on and see if you notice something. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. So you kind of catch my voice wants to do this little sing-song thing about that. Um, what it is that Frost has organized his lines here into feet. And feet are when you have two part segments in each line. So two parts, basically two words, two words, two words, two words, all in a row to create a line. And iambic is when you stress the last syllable or the second word of that foot. So we take a line here. Whose woods these are, I think I know. Notice, whose woods these are, I think I know. There are four sets of feet there. Whose woods these are, I think I know. And if I'm going to stress the last syllable as I read, whose woods these are, I think I know that second syllable being stressed is iambic. Why would Frost do this? One reason could be that when Frost wrote this poem, Robert Frost liked to write lots of poems about nature and the surrounding world around him. So the story of this poem is that a man is riding a horse through the woods. 
and it's filling up with snow. So the horse, as it's moving, if you've ever rode a horse before, you'll notice that it does like a, and I'm going to sound like Monty Python, the Holy Grail with my coconuts here, but it'll be like, ta 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 Like that's the sound of a horse moving. You read this poem to watch his woods fill up with snow. He is writing this poem to imitate the sound of a horse's hooves moving through snow. Genius! <laughs> it seems so simple and it seems so small, but the fact that someone took the time to think of that purpose in their writing and to execute it so well with the language, with the meter, with the sound, with the beat, it's genius. I mean, it's just good. And that's why Frost, you know, that's one of the reasons he's known as such a great poet is because he constantly is thinking not only of the words he's using, but how they all come together, the sound that they create when they're read aloud, the impact that that has. And it seems so subconscious, but it, that's the point of it. It's a subconscious thing that as you read, you are transported to this moment and to the sound. And it's great, right? So that brings us to Nellie. <laughs> okay. So as I said, I'm a nineties kid. So I grew up with Nellie constantly being on the radio. So I did notice though that Nellie has a good use of meter and iambic, <laughs> uh, feet that I wanted to show you all. And I was trying to find a good example of this. And there is a music critic who is known as Todd in the shadows. He is based out of Virginia. He lives in New York now, but he has his degree in music theory. He does a lot of pop music, rap music, country music, uh, reviews, uh, to be fair, he does not like current country music. So, um, but a few years ago, he did a review of Florida Georgia Lines cruise song and specifically the Nelly rap remix. And he talks a little bit very briefly about Nelly and his use of meter. So I wanted to show you all that video just to kind of um, exemplify my point of how this is used in a modern context because Robert Frost, bless his heart, he's pretty old. This stuff's pretty old, so I wanted to find you guys a current example. So bear with me. <laughs> I'm going to pull up the video that, where he talks about Florida Georgia Line, and I'm going to just show us the part where he talks about Nelly. But anyway, the remix was actually Nelly's idea. Yo, check it out the cruise video, man. And yeah, that thing the deal, but I think we need to turn it up, though. What you think? Both Florida and Georgia there say they were super psyched about it because they've been listening to Nelly since they were kids because... Holy crap, Country Grammar came out 13 years ago, and they would have been in middle school, and Nelly is almost 40, and I found a great hair in the mirror the other day, and... Anyway, why did Nelly pick this song to guest on? Well, like I said, the subject matter fits, but... Also, have you ever listened to Nelly's flow, that, that sing-songy thing he does? Yeah, if you listen, it's just two notes. Two notes, the fourth part, like this. And cruise. When I first saw that bikini top on her, she's popping right out of the South Georgia water. Da 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 da. Two notes, perfect for Nelly. So yeah, his flow that he talks about is basically um, his use of meter. He said it was two parts, two parts. And da 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 that's meter. And that is Nelly using it. So now every time you hear him on the radio, you can remember Miss Parrish talking to you about meter and how yo Nelly uses it. So <laughs> um this is what you expected to listen to in your English video, right? Alright, but that's my point, is that there are a lot of modern artists and poets that use meter and are using these terminologies in their lyrics, in their music right now, and once you figure it out, you can kind of pinpoint it and pick it out pretty easy. Now, there are different types of rhyming that we have. We have half slant, um, half and slant rhymes, which are a pair of words that do not rhyme, but sound very similar. So, if I look down on uh, page 629 in our textbook, we have kind of an example of some half rhymes and slant rhymes there. So let me go under there. Let me see if I can find a good one in that poem. 
that's exemplified there. So, so like on page 630, you look at um, from a satirical romance, look in that second verse there where it says, importuning her disdain with such pressing desire, why is it goodness you then require who have caused her shame? So this is a translated poem, so you'll notice that as I'm reading it, my voice isn't doing that sing-songy thing because it kind of loses its rhythm. It's sort of like when you hear a song that was first in Spanish and then they've translated it to English. I think of Shakira. You hear some of her songs and you're like, man, this sounds okay, but it seems a little off. And then you hear the actual Spanish version and you're like, oh, they just translated this to English. That's why it doesn't sound so like lyrical and musical. Um, that's why. But you can see desire and require. Desire and require don't technically rhyme but they sound like they do. So we call that a slant rhyme where they don't really rhyme. They don't have the exact same worded last syllable, like choir and sire are not rhymes, but they're slant rhymes. They're close. They're like halfway there. That's what we call a half or a slant rhyme. And then we have the big one, free verse versus open form. Now I told you all at the beginning of this video that Sometimes poetry doesn't rhyme, and sometimes it doesn't look like poetry. This is the case. You have free verse and you have open form. Now free verse is no holds bar. There are no rules. It barely resembles a poem. And the only thing that stylistically ties it to poetry is that maybe it's just about an emotion or a mood. There's no plot. There's no characters. It's just about a moment. But if you go back to page 610 in our book, Right before that picture of Michael Jordan, you see Dylan Thomas's uh, little excerpt there. I don't know if you all noticed that, but it's Dylan Thomas's, that little paragraph. That's a poem. It looks like a quote, but it's a poem. It's free verse. Yeah. Now, myself, I am a little bit more traditional about poetry. I'm not a fan of free verse, but that's just me. That is my own stylistic bias. I like poems that rhyme or at least have some slant or half rhyme to them. I'm just not big into the avant-garde, free verse, we're just going to make it experimental. That's not my jam. But I do know a lot of people that do slam poetry. Um, I have friends from college that wrote poetry and did different talks and sessions with them. Um, and they like free verse, and that's cool. The, it's the nice thing about literature. Everybody has their own flavor that they like. Um, free verse is just not for me. But I have a lot of friends that do like it. So if you want to try your hand at free verse, go for it. Should be good. Um, the other type, though, is open form. And that is poetry that does not have to rhyme or have a pattern, but it still looks like poetry. You'll notice in the term here, open form. It still has a form. It may not rhyme. It may not follow a pattern but it still looks like a poem. It has verses, it has lines. On paper, you wouldn't be able to distinguish it from any other poem, except maybe it just doesn't have that pattern or rhythm to it, but it still has the form of poem. So you will be asked to differentiate between these two on your poetry exam. And free verse is exactly that. It's just free, no rules, but open form still has a little bit of a structure there. All right. Um, how to interact and read poetry. And this is the big thing because poetry gets everyone frustrated, it seems, and it does require a little bit more uh, treading or careful treading as you get into it. Um, one, give it a close reading. You can't just skim through a poem. You'll probably miss a whole lot. So you do need to sit down. Poems typically aren't long. So you need to sit down, give the poem your full attention, and read it close. See what every word is and try to decipher what is that meaning. Um, get your bearings. Know your author. That whole Robert Frost bit about the horse, a lot of people may not have realized it if they didn't realize Robert Frost was back in the 1800s. We didn't have cars. So that's what the whole horse trotting is. You know, uh, read about your author. Get to know their history. A lot of times poets put themselves into the writing, so it's important to know that poet before you even read their first poem and just kind of get an understanding of where they're coming from in terms of being an author. Um, respond to the poem as a whole. Sometimes when people start reading a poem, they might get discouraged. They might be like, I don't know what this means. 
you do need to read through the whole thing. I promise to, to get a full understanding. And even if you don't understand it after you've read the poem, you still need to read the whole thing to get a big picture of, of what it all is. Even if you're like, I don't know what this means, you still get an idea of the poem as a whole. And get into the spirit of the poem. If the poem is lighthearted like Shel Silverstein or Dr. Seuss, then, you know, get into that mood. You know, you're like, okay, this is supposed to be lighthearted and funny. Um, and if it's supposed to be a serious poem, then it will definitely, your mindset needs to be serious in order to get the full effect of what the author is intending. And be ready for a personal response. A lot of times poets, they write poetry to elicit an emotional response. They want you to feel a certain way, whether it's excited or uncomfortable or calm or peaceful. There's a, there's a method to the madness, so to speak. So um, you've just got to be ready to experience that. And then kind of at the end of the poem say, okay, why do I feel this way after I've read it? And not every poem will elicit this big emotional response, but it could happen. You never know. All right. And finally, um, we are going to talk about specific terminology in the weeks to come. Like I said, this is just the preview chapter. This is just letting us soak into poetry. <laughs> um, the last part here I want to talk about are vignettes and haikus. And I will be honest, I had a student... Uh, a few years ago that hated haikus. I mean, hated and was like, are we going to do stupid haikus? And as he's saying that, I'm pulling up the slide. <laughs> and I was like, yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but yes, we have vignettes and we have haikus. We won't deal with vignettes so much. They are um, what's called snapshot poetry. They are simply poetry that is no more than three lines. Doesn't matter if they have a rhyme scheme but they are no more than three lines of poetry. Um, haikus, on the other hand, are three lines of poetry, specifically, and they have a very specific syllable requirement. The syllable requirements are five, seven, five. So that means the first line of poetry is five syllables, second line is seven syllables, and the final line are five syllables. So we have here, class is almost done. Can you hear spring calling now? Wish class was over. So if I, um, the easiest way is like if you like clap it out or time it out. So if you're like, class is almost done. One, two, three, four, five. Can you hear spring calling now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Wish class was over. One, two, three, four, five. So yeah. Um, we'll be doing haikus in this class, and you'll be required to do them, so just uh, get yourself familiar with it. But, um, but yeah, vignettes and haikus. Fun stuff. Exciting times. All right. So that's the presentation side of it. And now, here in just a second, we are going to talk about the Paper 2 Guidelines. All right. So we're going to discuss uh, the Paper 2 Guidelines now for the class. Um, it starts out... Um, here and these guidelines are on our resources page talking about um, just the purpose of poetry and kind of reviewing what we've discussed a little bit here. Um, there are several options for this paper so like with our first paper you have different ways um, you can go about constructing this paper although I will say that paper number two is probably the most restrictive of your options um, just because I want to incorporate poetry and the terms that we learn and still have a little bit of a creative element to it, so um, bear with me as I explain all of these options. So option one is that you can choose two poems from our textbook and compare and contrast them. Um, how they use the different elements of poetry, how they're constructed, what's the similarities and differences. Um, if you find two poems that are outside of this textbook that you want to use, you're welcome to do that as well. Although the textbook, there's so many examples in it, it'll probably be the easiest. And then at the end of your paper, you are going to create a short poem, as in one to two stanzas, um, of your own that mirrors one or both of the poets or poems that you've analyzed. So it's kind of like you're talking about two poems and at the very end, you kind of create your own little short poem that imitates either one of the two poems you talked about or both. So there's a little bit of a creative writing element to it, 
but for the most part you're just analyzing and comparing and contrasting two poems. Um, and the third option is going to be similar to that, which we will talk about here in a second. Um, the second option, which I've had a lot of students do, is that you choose two photographs of your, uh, of your own, and you create a poem for each of them. And this is a short poem, like a few stanzas, half a page. And then the rest of the paper, you break down and explain your decisions, the terms you used. It's basically like you're critiquing yourself and showing how you made the poems that you include in your paper. So it's totally a creative writing option. Option number two is. Um, the nice thing about option two is that since you're using your own photographs, you don't have to do any citation other than your book. So that is nice. Um, but on the opposite end, if you're not a creative writing person or you don't want to create two poems versus the one, then this might not be the option for you. Which leads to option three. Option three is similar to option one, except you are comparing and contrasting two songs because songs are lyrics. So you're comparing and contrasting two different songs and showing which ones do you think is better, um, how has poetry transitioned from text to spoken word or song, and then at the end you'll create your own short poem or song <laughs> um, that mimics the style. So it's very much like option one except you're using songs instead of poems. So with whatever option you pick, there is a little bit of a creative writing element, but please note, this is not a creative writing class. So your grade is not going to be determined on how creative you are. What I'm interested in is that in the short stanzas you create, you show that you understand the terminology of the poems you're analyzing, that you understand how they work and that you can imitate them. That's pretty much it. I mean, I'm not going to grade your poem based on whether it's good or not. I'm more concerned over whether or not it uses the elements of poetry that you say it's going to. Because this isn't a creative writing class, but I want to use this exercise of, of writing a short little poem to kind of emphasize that you understand how they're constructed. Okay? Uh, as far as formatting goes, the page analysis itself needs to be two full pages. So this paper is a little bit shorter than the last one, but your poem that you create should it be at least half a page. Now if you choose option two, option two, the pro is you're getting to be creative. The con is you have two full pages of analysis and two half page poems instead of just one with options one and three. So um, it's not that much more, but just be aware that you are creating two poems instead of one if you choose option two. Um, with options one and three, you're creating one poem so you have basically two and a half pages total of text. Uh, the font for the analysis should be exactly like what you did for paper number one. Um, when it comes to the poems though, you can go crazy. You can use whatever font you want, whatever size you want, however you want to format it. Um, that's fine. But the analysis part needs to be 12 point font and look very much like an essay. Uh, margins are the same. Grammar is something I'm going to be looking at. Um, and then your works cited. You, we are going to start practicing with MLA citations. You do need to cite your, cite your textbook in this paper. And that's because, one, you're probably going to be using poems from your textbook if you chose option one or three. And two, you're going to be talking about elements of poetry that are in your textbook. So um, you will need to cite your textbook. This will be our first kind of foray into MLA. So if you've not watched the video for week five, you might want to go back and watch it um, as you're doing citations for this paper. If you cite any other sources, any other books, any videos online, anything like that, you do need to cite them. But all else fails, you're citing one source for this paper, which is our textbook. And that should be on a works cited page on its own. Um, and then your in-text citations should be in the analysis. And then, of course, everything is due on time. So, uh, due dates, uh, this is changing, <laughs> no, no late submissions, <laughs> and it won't let me change it, um, I'll change it on the actual version, this is an old policy, and I should have changed it to here, I'm not doing late submissions, because you all have until March 10th to do this paper, which is plenty of time, so your thesis statement is due Sunday the 17th, 
your outline is due the 24th, then we skip a week, and then you have your paper due. So you pretty much have a month to write this paper, which is a lot of time. And um, you should be able to submit early if you want to. This will be deleted. So, and I know that some students get mad that their instructors don't allow late work, but I've dealt with it in the past. And in all honesty, it just snowballs. And from my experience teaching, students just let it snowball and then it just ends up hurting your grade worse. So I would much rather if you miss a paper or miss an assignment, you know, that sucks. But if you move on and get the other assignments done to counteract it, usually your grade will end up being just fine. So if you have questions, you can email me. Uh, the point breakdown is a little different than the first paper. Um, in this paper, your introduction and conclusion will get some points. Um, the elements of poetry that you describe, um, creativity and effort if it looks like you tried <laughs> on the poems and try to use the elements of poetry that you talk about in your paper, you'll get those points, uh, grammar and spelling, and then page length and formatting. So if you have any questions about that, please let me know. Otherwise though, uh, that's pretty much everything for this week. I'm so excited about poetry and getting to talk about it with you all. Uh, we're going to dive more into the chapters next week, but for now, have a great week, and I look forward to reading and grading all of your paper number ones. <laughs> all right, see you guys later. Bye.